This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This video lecture is for the course ME273 Statics, and we use the book Statics by R.C. Hibbler. Today I'm going to be talking about 8.3 wedges and 8.5 frictional forces on flat belts. We're not going to cover uh, 8.4 frictional forces on screws. So after today, you'll be able to determine the forces on a wedge and determine the tension in the belt. First, we'll look at some applications, then we'll analyze a wedge, analyze a belt, and then we'll do some problem solving. So wedges are used to adjust the elevation or provide stability for heavy objects such as this large steel pipe. So this wedge is preventing the pipe from moving. Um, how can we determine the force required to pull out the wedge? When there are no applied forces on the wedge, will it stay in place? Is it going to be what we call self-locking? Or would it come out on its own? Belt drives are commonly used for transmitting the torque developed by a motor to uh, a wheel attached to a, a fan, a blower, a pump, or something like that. So how can we decide if the belts will function properly? That is, without slipping or without breaking. And here we see a handbrake, and when you're designing this, it's essential to analyze the frictional forces acting on the band, which acts like a belt. And that band is this right here that goes around like that, and it's fixed at A. So how can you determine the tension in the cable? Also from a design perspective, how are the belt tension, the applied force, and the torque, M, related? The torque would, of course, be the braking torque. So first, let's analyze a wedge. Now, a wedge is a simple machine in which a small force, P, is used to lift a large weight, W. To determine the force required to push the wedge in or out, it's necessary to draw a free body diagram of the wedge and the object on top of it. So in this analysis, we're going to be drawing two free body diagrams. It's easier to start with the free body diagram of the wedge since you know the direction of its intending motion. Now, here are three important points. The frictional forces are always in the direction opposite to motion or impending motion of the wedge. The frictional forces are along the contacting surfaces, so this surface, this surface, and this surface. And the normal forces are perpendicular to these surfaces. So you can see that here. This contacting surface here gives us N1. It's normal, so it's pointing up. N2, which is the normal force between the wedge and the block, you know, is normal to the wedge angle, so it looks like that. And the frictional forces are directed along the contacting surfaces. So here's a free body diagram of the wedge. We have the frictional force against the wall, the normal force against the wall, the weight of the block, the normal force uh, between the block and the wedge, and the frictional force between the block and the wedge. Now note that when we draw the free body diagram of the wedge, we need to invert the orientation of F2 and N2. So we just saw the free body diagram of the block, and here's the free body diagram of the, wed of the wedge right here. And like I just said, if F2 is pointing in this direction, then you need to make it point in the opposite direction. And likewise with N2. And we have N1, the normal force between the ground and the wedge, and F1, the frictional force between the ground and the wedge, and this force P. Now of these two free body diagrams, which one should we start looking at first? Well, we should look at the one that has the least amount of unknowns. Now, here's an important point. If the object is to be lowered, then the wedge needs to be pulled out. Now, if the value of that force comes out to be positive, then we call the wedge self-locking. Now, if it comes out to be negative, then the wedge will eject on its own. Now let's take a look at belts. Uh, consider this flat belt passing over this uh, fixed curve surface with a total angle of contact equal to beta radians. If the belt slips or is just about to slip, then 
T2 must be greater than T1 and the motion resistant frictional forces. There's a detailed analysis in the book. It's uh, rather complicated. I'm not going to go over it here, but the analysis shows that the uh, tension force T2 is equal to T1 times the um, E rate of mu to the beta. So T2 is equal to T1 times uh, E raised to the coefficient of friction mu times the angle beta. Make sure that you do beta in radians in this equation. Okay, let's do some examples and I think this will become a lot more uh, clearer. Um, so we're given a 3,000 pound load is applied to this wedge B. Uh, the coefficient of static friction between A and C and between B and D, so that's this surface and this surface, is uh, 0 0.3. And between the wedges A and B, it's 0 0.4. And we're going to assume the wedges have negligible weight compared to you know, the weight of the applied load. Find the smallest force P needed to lift that load 3,000 pounds. So we're going to assume impending motion here because uh, we want to start lifting the block. So we're just about getting ready to move. So draw the free body diagrams of wedge A and B. Uh, apply the equations of equilibrium to wedge B. And we do wedge B first because it has fewer unknowns. And then we'll apply the equations of equilibrium to wedge A. So here are the free body diagrams. Uh, again, it's impending motion, so we know that the frictional forces are equal to mu sub s times n. So we have the frictional force between the ground and A is 0 0.3 and some c. The frictional force between the two wedges is uh, 0 0.4 times n. Uh, we have the normal force between wedges A and B. And we have the applied load P. And lastly, the normal force C between the ground and the wedge A. Now, the free body diagram of wedge B, remember you have to put the forces common to those two blocks have to be in opposite directions. So now we have F pointing down and to the right, and it's 0.4N, and the normal force is pointing in the first quadrant. Uh, we have the normal force between the, block, the wedge and the wall. We have the frictional force between the wedge and the wall. And since it's impending motion, we know that the frictional force is 0.3 times n sub d. So we have, we have three unknowns here, right? We have n sub d um, and, uh, and n. So let's establish a coordinate system. And um, first, let's do wedge b. So summation of forces in the x direction is equal to 0. So that would be... Uh, first, we have n, and it's positive, and it is n times sine of 15. And then we have um, the component of this force, and the frictional force in the x direction. It's positive, so 0 0.4 times n uh, times the cosine of 15. And lastly, we have uh, the normal force in the wall and the wedge B, and that's minus N sub D. Summing forces in the Y direction, set that equal to zero. So now we have uh, N times cosine of 15, and it's positive. We have the weight applied load, minus 3,000. Um, we have the component of the this force in the Y direction, it's negative. So it's minus 0 0.4 times N times the sine of 15. Then lastly, we have the F sub D, which is negative, so minus 0 0.3 N sub D. Two equations, two unknowns, we can solve for N. We get 44.85 pounds, and N sub D equal to 28.94 pounds. And on a test, remember, you would say 44.90 and 2890. So now let's do wedge A and we solve for N in the previous solution and we okay establish a coordinate system 
first it's some forces in the y direction. So we have uh, n sub c uh, plus this component of the frictional force in the y direction, which would be positive. So plus 0 0.4 times 44.85 times the sine of 15. And then lastly, we have the component of the normal force in the y direction. It's negative, so it's minus 44.85. Uh, times cosine of 15. Some forces in the x direction, so if that equal to 0, this is also equal to 0. So in the x direction, we're working on wedge A now, so it's we have P and it's positive, uh, minus 0 0.3 n sub C, uh, minus the normal force in the uh, x direction, it's negative, so minus 44.85 times sine of 15, And then we have the component of the frictional force between the two wedges. We saw for that earlier. It's negative, so minus 0 0.4 times 44.85 times the sine of 15. I'm sorry, it's cosine of 15. And you can solve those two equations. You get uh, N sub C is equal to 38.68. Pounds, so it would be 38.70, and P is equal to 4054 pounds, so 40.50. So let's do another one here. We have a force P applied to move the wedge A to the right. Uh, we're told that there's, there's a spring here, spring constant of 15 kilonewtons per meter. We're told the spring is compressed uh, 0.175 meters. So we'll be able to calculate the uh, force due to the spring. And the static coefficient of friction is 0 0.35 for all contacting surfaces. And we're told to neglect the weight of A and B. Find the smallest force P needed to move the wedge. So we're going to draw free body diagrams of the block B and the wedge A. Uh, we're going to apply equations of equilibrium to block B. And that's going to give us the frictional force between B and A. And then we're going to apply equations of equilibrium to wedge A. Again, we're asked for the smallest force required to um, move the wedge A. So we're in impending slip conditions. So here's a free body diagram of wedge A. We have the normal force. Uh, it's impending motion, so the frictional force is mu sub S times N sub A. Uh, we've got the normal force between blocks A and B, and we've got the frictional force between blocks A and B, and again, impending motion, so frictional force is 0 0.35 times N sub B, and we have the applied load, P. And the free body diagram of block B is shown here. Uh, we have the normal force between the blocks, and again, those are in opposite directions. The frictional force between the, the two wedges between the wedge and the block rather and it's also uh, in the opposite direction as it was in the previous free body diagram uh, and we have the force due to the spring which is 15 kilonewtons per meter times 0 0.175 meters so that force is 2.625 kilonewtons and lastly we have the normal force between the block and the wall so let's apply the equations of equilibrium to this one first since we um, only have two unknowns, so summation of forces in the x direction is equal to zero. So we have uh, minus n sub c plus 0 0.35 n sub b is equal to zero, and summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. So we have n sub b, uh, and then minus the spring force, which is 2.65 kilonewtons. And from this, we get N sub B is equal to 2.625 kilonewtons. So now let's apply the equations of equilibrium to the wedge A. And this is uh, this normal force we solved for earlier. And so now we know the frictional force as well. And we only have uh, two unknowns, N sub A and P. So we should be able to solve this. So let's uh, sum forces in the X and Y direction. Summation of forces in the x equal to zero. 
equal to now P is positive, so P uh, minus the frictional force here, its component in the X is negative, so minus 0.35 N sub A times the cosine of 10. Uh, we have the, this frictional force here, it's negative, so it's minus 0.35 times 2.625. That's it. One, two, we have one more to go. Uh, it's a component of the normal force in the x direction, so that is uh, negative, so it's minus n sub a times sine of 10. Summing forces in the y direction, so that equals zero. Uh, we have the component of n sub a, so that would be uh, n sub a times the cosine of 10. We have this component in the y is going to be negative, so minus 0.35 n sub a um, times the sine of 10. And then minus the uh, normal force, minus 2.625 kilonewtons. So from this, we get N sub A is equal to 2.841 kilonewtons, and P is 2.39 kilonewtons. So on a test, you would say 2.84. Okay, this concludes the lecture on 8.3 wedges and 8.5 frictional forces on belt. We're going to skip the rest of chapter 8, I think it's 8.6 or 8.9 or 8.8. And so the next video is going to be on 9.1, center of gravity, center of mass, and the centroid of a body. See you in cyberspace.